What? Yeah. No, I'm... Yeah, I'm behaving myself. No, I'm not playing in abandoned buildings. What? Again? Now. I suppose you had those people follow me again. Fine. Hey. This is Jimmy Farrow from Monty and the Farrow, and I want to thank all our subscribers. We have now passed 14,000 on our YouTube channel. But I want to ask our subscribers to take the next step for us and become a full-fledged member of Monty and the Farrow. Yeah, that's right, folks. There's three different levels to choose from. There's free shirts. There's free autographs. Just check it out and become a member of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and the Pharaoh. Later. Welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty the Pharaoh, only seen out of indie music TV, straight out of Ron Conkama, Long Island. I'm back. Yeah, man. I don't know how back I am. I'll do the best I can. You're but back, back we had a major help here as we've got the great Sean Oliver as a special guest today. So I'm as I'll be quiet most of the show, Sean and the Pharaoh will have it. Um, but suspension. Yeah. The channel yeah. sucks. Yeah, does. Three months. Well, I said, Blows. Sean, why he doesn't get suspended with all yeah. the shit How come he, he does yeah, on his well, channel. Wait a minute. How come he doesn't? Yeah. Three picking times Picking on now. us again. Three yeah, times. Yeah, they like picking on us. But on some important news before Whatever. we get to Mr. Oliver, uh, another school shooting, Farrell. Oh, God. Here we go again. Um, after a, a warning on a school intercom, uh, a gunman with an AR-15 style rifle Killed a teacher and a student while others jumped from windows. As a 19-year-old gunman walked through the St. Louis High School hallways with an AR-15 style rifle and over 600 rounds of ammunition, frightened students and teachers locked classroom doors and huddled in corners. Some heard gunshots and someone uh, trying to open the doors, they recall. They could hear that. The attack Monday at uh, Central Visual and Performing Arts High School at least the 67th shooting on U.S. school grounds this year would leave two dead. Student Alexandria Bell, 15 years old, and teacher Jean Kuxa, 61. Other students would be injured. Uh, a teacher tried uh, and died trying to save students from a school shooter who obviously, uh, you know, killed, successfully killed somebody right before their Sweet 16. Uh, after a gun battle with officers yet... Another American school shooter also would be dead. This time, a recent graduate identified as Orlando Harris, who arrived at the campus with extensive arsenal and a handwritten note. And this is in St. Louis. Like so many uh, stories of carnage uh, at places meant for learning and friendship, the school they had begun just like any other. But then the assistant principal's voice came over the intercom with a signal familiar to children who live with this kind of threat. Miles Davis is in the building. It was a signal only heard during active shooter drills. Now people were jumping from windows. Well, once again, I got to say, uh, I guess this is uh, the reason why we should not close psych centers. Because you cannot, obviously, either A, families are not paying attention to their children and not reading the warning signs that your children or child is about to go absolutely psycho. Or uh, perhaps maybe the uh, thought of just handing somebody a pill and telling themselves to rehab at home may not be working. So, uh, you know, in the, in the past, at least in my generation, if you were even slightly suspected of having something wrong with you, you were uh, probably going to get screened and possibly sent to a place like South Oaks or Sagamore or wherever it was. You know, they made sure that they uh, got on top of that before you uh, fully developed into a uh, Dylan Klebold or an Eric Harris. Uh, this world has become completely insane, and um, apparently it doesn't matter who's in charge, 
whether it's the last regime or the regime before, whoever's in charge, people are getting their guns and they're just shooting everybody. So, so much for uh, political persuasions. It's a bunch of yada yada. And, uh, you know, we all want to see something to change it, obviously, but uh, not looking good right now. Well, you keep saying it. We need those psych facilities. Yep. And it's not. But it care. doesn't get any worse. The world's dirtiest man dies in <laughs> Iran at 94 <laughs> after a few months after they force him to take a bath. Do he died from a bath? From a bath. He di Wait a minute. Oi. All right. Well, let's find out a little bit of something about this world. World's dirtiest man. You know, uh, did he get any trademark for this? Did he make any money off of this? Don't know. I he should have. Uh, he didn't take a shower for more than a half a century. Could you imagine? And, uh, and has died. Wait a minute. He lived till he was 94. Apparently, soap is extremely overrated. Apparently. Sounds like it. So, so, so was hair conditioner, probably, too. You know, aren't you glad you used Dial? You might not want to. Living to 94. Uh, he was covered in soot. His name was Haji. Um, he covered in soot and living in a cinder block shack. Uh, he had not bathed with water or soap for more than 60 years. Uh, and the villagers said the reason for this was he experienced emotional setbacks in his youth. What, did somebody put the hose on him when he was a kid? It's just like, I don't get that part, but okay. That must have been some setback for him to not touch uh, water Two or things that I have problems with, stinky people and people with bad teeth. Wow, you wouldn't have liked Haji very much, would you? Haji's not my friend. If you didn't know it, <laughs> that is to the right of the show is Mr. Jimmy Farrow. Jimmy, Hello. along with his partner, Hi. Part Griggs, <clears throat> make up the band with Steer Hall, whose channel we are loaning out for the next three months because we get suspended and guys like Sean Oliver just don't. keep cruising along, yeah, making keep... money, and we get effed over yeah we do because we talk politics and i guess you can't talk politics you can't make any kind of statement why did you just say that word well politics shame on you oh, mysterious hall's music again. can be found on youtube spotify itunes and reverb nation your partner's name is Man. monty nefaro could also be seen on youtube yeah, facebook live sometimes. no well not anymore <laughs> iHeartRadio, spotify anchor twitch tv channel 115 in new york on tuesdays at 9 30 and 11 30 and channel 20 at tuesday at 1 a.m that's where we'll find us i want to thank all the fans who's given me my prayers i'm yes. glad to be back it's going to be a little bit of a long haul doctors are going to tell me that it's going to take me about four or five months until i feel like i feel normal I uh, lost a little blood during the surgery, got anemia, so if you hear me taking deep breath, it's not because the heart isn't working, it's because my body can't get enough oxygen to the rest of my body while I'm blowing out big, big bags of air. Big bags of air. We'll be right back with, I gotta tell you, this is I awesome. gotta thank this guy, uh, this is uh, awesome. he is the OG. He is. He is an icon. To me, he is, and absolutely. He's, and, and, you know, yeah. and to I love be him. honest, I love he's his, made... I love his stuff. He's made some great... Um, I want to use the right words, but he's he's changed the landscape of professional wrestling. He sure has. He sure We'll has. be right back with the great Sean Oliver. See you in a sec. You want to star in your own success? Call QuickCast. www.quickcast.com. 866-7-CAST-NOW. That's 8667-CAST-NOW. Quick cast. Start your own success. Do you treat your dog as part of the family? <laughs> well, so do we. So why not celebrate your pup's birthday with the ultimate party box? Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Party Pup Info, and let us make your pup's party or any celebration perfection. Hi, it's Josh from Under the Table Hot Sauce. I'm here with my friend, the star of the show, Jimmy Farrow. Yeah, what's up, JB? Nah, nothing. It's been a hot summer, and for all your barbecue needs, you can go to UndertheTableHotSauce.com. 13 unique flavors to choose from, created and bottled in a Long Island kitchen. UndertheTableHotSauce.com. Let's go chow, JB. Let's do it. All the flavor, twice the burn. Okay. All right, welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty DeFaro, only seen here out of Indie Music TV, straight out of Oconcoma, Long Island, where we're welcoming welcome the great Sean Oliver. Sean, thank you for joining us, my friend. Yeah, yeah. Here I am. Listen, you should know that I, I am here for one reason. I demand now only to go on shows where a host has returned from heart surgery because 
the 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 incessant banter of two hosts it gets confusing sometimes in my head so if we can kind of take one out with uh with a serious surgery um i find the interview just goes easier well i appreciate that sean and i'm sure my family appreciates it as my wife is crying in her bed right now as you've wished death upon me but thank you thank you so much not death not death oh life-saving surgery which you had thank you sir so sean on a serious note i want to applaud you and your partner kevin nash um you know obviously i'm home from surgery uh Everybody, uh, mostly everybody knows that Kevin lost his son, unfortunately, which no parent has to go through. But <clears throat> shockingly enough to me, finding out that you guys put on a show, um, and I got to tell you how emotional for me personally, listening to that show as I'm doing my laps around my backyard listening to you and Kevin discuss that situation. And um, I can clearly make this statement that Kevin Nash is five times the man I am because I never could ever, ever do a show after something like that. And you're five times the man I am because being a host and being able to keep it as light as you did, but as serious as you did, um, all I can say is I'm in awe of you, sir, and in awe of Kevin. Any remarks? Well, um, thank you, first of all. But uh, I – all right, so it was a two-day – it was like a two-day process. I, I knew that Tristan was taken to the hospital. I knew that um, it wasn't going well, and then I knew he passed. So, as a producer of content, as you know firsthand, you're fragmented. <clears throat> the responsibility of a show and then the responsibility of being a decent human being. And I've always said, I said it in one of my books and I've told people, generally the things that make you a good content producer don't make you a good human being and vice versa. Most good people would not be successful content producers. Um, they seem to function at uh, at odds at times. So, so here comes this news. I'm crushed, knowing knowing Tristan, knowing Kevin, but also carrying a weight that um, Kevin has a lot to deal with, and I'm going to need to put a plan in place. I'm going to have to prepare for something. So. Um, there was that part of me, um, that balance of grieving and just disbelief and the pain, uh, and thinking about, you know, my friend, Kevin, but then also, um, Tristan died at six in the morning on a Wednesday and we shoot Wednesday nights. So I got the guys started on a best of episode and was also thinking long term. Um, let's get, you know, I'm thinking in terms of let's get a replacement in. I don't know how much time he's going to need, but let's prepare to have a, a, a replacement host. The old Carson thing, right? We'll call Joan Rivers and, uh, and she'll come on and, and host. And about six o'clock that night, Kevin texts me, what's going on? When are we starting? I said, you have the night off and uh, we're going to run a best of show for Monday. And Kevin said, uh, I have to talk to the world about the death of my son. And I said, okay, you know, uh, I'll set it up. And um, we went on air without any of the normal segments we do. Uh, and, and we were just going to talk about Tristan and, and the memory of Tristan. The harder show, believe it or not, was the one that's in the can now for Monday. 
because a week had passed. And you can't just go back to normal. So it was a toe into the waters of normal, the second show. But that was the hardest for me because, um, you know, we, we, if you've, if you've listened to our show or watched our show, we kind of, we kind of cover the gamut. Um, there's not unlike you guys, there's politics, there's, there's life stories, there's wrestling, there's whatever we want to talk about. So, um, it, we knew it wasn't going to be entirely a Tristan show, but, um, but of course, we're we're seven days out, and I realize that the show is kind of functioning as a social experiment too, because fans are in real time with us because we were on air the week Tristan passed. So the shock of that experiencing Kevin dealing with it, talking about it, then one week out. Now we're one week out, and after about an hour and a half, when I was going to sign off. Uh, I forget what we were talking about, but it, I guess it was funny. And I said, Kev, you're laughing. And um, I wanted him to realize that, that we were a few steps closer to normal. I don't think you ever get to normal if you lose a child, but um, we were closer to normal than we were a week ago. And that's, I guess, the expectation. That's what we're going to learn. We get, we'll get closer to normal uh, with each step. How did you and Kevin come up with the idea for the show? Just curious. In 2018, I found an old uh, pad with with uh, notes on it. <clears throat> he first, well, let me go back even further. I had a band called Kayfabe Commentaries back in the day, and uh, Kevin was a frequent ge a frequent guest on a lot of our shoot interviews, and. Um, fans always talked about our chemistry together and would share clips about it and, and always said, you guys need to do a podcast. You should do a podcast. You should do a podcast. So 2018, we talked about it for the first time. And it's just been, I guess, four years of foreplay. And then uh, it was actually Tristan who's, a big podcast fan and, and had turned his dad on to podcasts and they would watch and Tristan would keep saying, I learned this this week, by the way, on, on the show. Um, you could do this dad. you could do this. You could talk about this. You could talk about stuff and you can be entertaining. You could do this. So uh, Kevin was like, yeah, you know, I talked to Sean about it and, and, and he was like, well, we'll call him now, now, you know, do it for real. So, Kevin called me and, and had like a, listen, if we're ever going to do this, we have to do it now kind of thing. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's put it together and I'll shop it around and, and we'll see where, where it lands. Go to the highest bidder. Um, there you go. And the, the, the philosophy behind this show was, to quote Kevin, two guys talking at the bar. Excellent. And that's kind of what we wanted it to feel like for, for listeners, that you could pull up a chair and whatever we were waxing about, um, you join the conversation. And I think that kind of personal... See, I listen to other wrestler podcasts. Okay. And they're working. I, I guess being a worker, you're always working. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's... I don't feel that 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 I'm getting the the real person. I, the, the the warts and all stripped down organic version of the person. Right. Um. So we wanted to make sure that we gave people that, and I think what it did, um, based on the the popularity, was the listeners feel a part of the show, and that's very important and so we give them access to us on twitter and also we read a lot of their comments on air and we're going to be doing some live stuff soon um so that was kind of the the, the if there's a recipe th that's the magic recipe that uh if you're listening you're in the click too would you uh were you uh 
surprised at the level of success so quickly, or did you expect it? I mean, after all, you and Kevin do have great chemistry, and it does feel organic. I mean, how, how do you feel about the reaction from the public? I was confident, but as you guys know, there are there's so much competition for the viewers' eyes and listeners' ear right now. So there was not just the challenge of putting on an entertaining show. We had to cut through a lot of noise and a lot of other podcasts. I mean, I have probably, I don't know, 30 that I follow and that download. And that's not even the ones I run into when I fall down the YouTube rabbit hole hmm. looking at, you know, videos of lover boy on the road again mike reno's huge i don't know what happened <laughs> Too funny. Looks like he, he just got mike chubby um, instead of lucky you, Oi. you gotta look you, yeah. check it out it was he does the headband still but it, it's like it's but like he's, he's eating for the weekend I, oh, and, and no longer that, work that's exactly uh, what i was thinking are we related that's exactly what i was just thinking Pretty nice smart. nice what made you get into podcast in general i mean you're clearly an innovator and that's something that we both absolutely admire uh my partner and myself what made you get into this whole world in the first place well it it's it's the shoot interview 2.0 isn't it it's um no one's paying for a la carte content anymore so um the mo the shoot interview model that we worked for 12 13 years whatever it was was expensive um made a lot of money but okay. it also you know it was a full production you know a set sean, lights. sean i don't want to cut you off that but is it fair to say that and from what i heard you became a millionaire off of this no uh the 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 the, the, the company certainly grossed uh more than a million dollars uh okay but it okay. but it's in the title of my book, I think you're referencing, you know, turning wrestlers interviews into a million dollars, which is literally what the company did. So, so the company's value was, but you know, there's people working there and there's expenses and overhead and the shoots, which I was touching on here, uh, were expensive. They were, they were lit. Well, they were miked. This may sound to anyone not familiar with the shoot interview game 20 years ago. This may seem like a basic thing, but lighting, sound, almost any production value at all uh, wasn't happening always. So we we it was very important to us if we were going to do this. It was going to look and feel like a real production, and um, which was 2007 when we started. So you know we're still shooting on tape. You know, digital video was just coming out. Um, and so eventually we of course had to upgrade everything, but, um, in stages, the production was important to us. So it was expensive. What happens? Well, at a certain point as popular as, as a podcast start rising in popularity, I have a guy coming in in two weeks that I, whatever, let's use round numbers. I'm paying him a grand. You know, the suite's 500 bucks. The food's going to be 300 bucks. I have a crew that'll be 400 bucks. You know, when we're all said and done, you know, it's a $3,000 day. I just hear this guy on Joe Fungul's podcast talking about everything I'm going to ask him about in two weeks, ostensibly appearing for free. There you go. On this there you go. Yep. On that podcast. Right. How's that model going to continue? How am I going to continue paying when it's being basically given away? And what was happening was it was more of a detriment to the workers because they were devaluing themselves, mm -hmm. their stories, the appearances. Yep. So um, I could be Bart Griggs if you want me to. Um, but, you know. <laughs> what, <laughs> there what? you go. Cha-ching. The, uh, the 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 lower third just uh, I, I, Bart Griggs popped up and then it became Sean Oliver for me. I like Bart Griggs better. I always hated my name. So really? if, we, if you want to go back to Bart Griggs, I'll be him. Um, what? So that's the the long answer to your short question. That it be, it began to morph. The shoot interview industry began to morph into the podcast industry. I would have been happy doing none of it, but it was clear that 
despite whatever else I did, whatever TV series I had optioned, oh. I, had, I had novels out, whatever else I was doing, it, that just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. I knew that wrestling was going to come knocking again. Well, I got to tell you, what you built, like we said, was innovative and it was real production. And I, I think at some point you might have to cringe when you see some of those shows out there. And like it, almost any wrestler will do any show now. I, I guess if you pay enough, they'll do anything. And it just looks like total dog shit. So I cringe. Are you cringing? <laughs> Look at him. He's cringing. <laughs> it's, um, <sighs> boy, it's, it's a tough thing. If you're going to ask someone to, pay for something. And this was always where I was with the production value aspect of this. And even when a, a talent came on and laid an egg, I'm like, I, I can't ask somebody to pay $20 for this. Mm. So talent A, um, while you're drooling onto your um, fanny pack slash pill holder, <laughs> when I'm trying to ask you a question, <laughs> yeah, I can't ask someone to pay for that, nor would your parole officer want to see this. So I'm going to take a loss today and cut you uh, off, uh, cut you uh, loose to go on your way, and we can do this another day. See, that's kind of funny because so, differently, what we do is we just let it run. Do what you want, say what you want, act what you want, and get us suspended, right, but we're right. going to show it. Yeah. We're dumb. Tell well, us we're we dumb. Have, <laughs> we always have the video. So, yeah. you know, we never cut the cameras. So yeah. all of the video lives in the library. Um, but it was just, it, there were, you know, a very small handful of times it was impossible to cut something. Together. There were some that I did. I cut together to make a, tang a, 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 a coherent conversation between me and the guest. Um, and, uh, and then... There was, you know, a time I had to send someone on their way, and it just came down to 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 somebody paying money for this. Mm. Um, I couldn't do it. it. It would have been deleterious to our reputation, but also disrespectful to the viewer. Now, somebody viewing something for free, sitting an ad sponsored program like yours, like our podcast. Now, if somebody's willing to to sit through. Uh, a bit of a train wreck of an interview. That's fine. There's nothing lost but time. And, you know, the viewer can turn it off and, and move on if they want mm -hmm. to. But at the time, it was a la carte programming, you know, $20 a pop for DVD. What was a DVD? What's a DVD? Yeah. Right. DVDs used to be these things we played programming on. So, yeah, I guess it was just a matter of, uh, of principle at the time. Sean, I, wa I want to get a little serious again. Um, one thing I was taken aback about on last Monday show on Click This, uh, that people were actually attacking Kevin Nash after the loss of his son. <sighs> Doesn't that in itself want to make you pull out of this bullshit? Um, if not for the... 500 to 1 ratio of people sharing stories about having lost their son and thanking Kevin for having the courage. People who donated to Autism Speaks or one of the other autism charities because Kevin's son was autistic. Uh, then, yes, uh, Monty, I, I might have. Uh, but the, the, the ratio was still... I called it a speed bump when I would scroll down in either YouTube. YouTube seems, seems to be a citadel for the soulless. Mm. So it was mm. most often on, on like YouTube. And, but when I would scroll through Twitter or scroll through YouTube, you know, a series of wonderful complimentary things. Then you hit the speed bump, some anti-vax goofball who's going to use this as a as a platform for their uneducated opinion. Um, hey, you can get away with that. To... You can get away with that on YouTube because if you went the other way, you would have just got us suspended for a fourth time. 
What's what? what do so you mean? So, if you would have went on as an anti, you know what? I shouldn't even be saying this mm. right now. If you went yeah. on as an anti-vaxer, oh you would have got us suspended. It's that it's that oh. quick and that simple. Oh, I, I understand. So, okay. being that you're pro-vaccination, and so is yeah. most of us, and we get that. But if you're an ant, if you have the opinion, Sean Oliver's simple opinion. You have got us suspended. We've been suspended for Missy Hyatt's vaccination thoughts, mm -hmm. Greg Valentine thinking Donald Trump won the election. The last election, right. And, right. and who's re – oh, Del Wilkes, Wilkes God Patriot. rest his soul, mm -hmm. who was a very intelligent man, who but had his was, political views, was, whether you believed them or he not. He was pro-Republican, and they didn't like it. it. Yeah, they didn't got like it. Got suspended for a fourth time, yeah. a third time. Sorry. Sean, I got to ask you, you're my favorite interviewer on YouTube, first of all. So again, thank you for coming on. But I got to ask you this question. Where, at what point is it really the interviewer's responsibility? Should the interviewer be assassinated by whatever forum his show is, is going under uh, because of a guest's opinion? What do you, is that uh, like a fuzzy? I know it's a tough question, but where, where's our rights as interviewers? Maybe you can help me with this. It's funny, uh, in, in the episode that's going to air this Monday, which okay. would be the 31st of October, Halloween, um, I went through the YouTube uh, monetization standards mm -hmm. because we occasionally have programming that gets demonetized. And our very diligent YouTube guru, Steve Kaufman, has to go through the appeals process, and he always gets it restated. But okay. we, you know, we, we fall into those gaps where we, we lose some time. And time is money. Uh, so I went item by item with Kevin. And I said, let's see how much we have violated here. Okay. Let's see, in, in their words, let's take their um, advertiser-friendly standards, which is what they call it. Gotcha. And let's go through and see which each of these we... About the, about the most we could admit to being guilty for is language. Right. Inappropriate language. Of course. I got you. So I, I guess that's why they were demonetizing some stuff. None, okay. none of the other things we really hit. Okay. I think I jokingly said we hit all of them and put some examples there. But, but the heart of a lot of that wasn't. Well, to your point, though, what is an interviewer's responsibility? Um, <sighs> you see, I, YouTube I, functions. I don't know, Sean. It's okay to go. So you raped that girl in 1972, and you threw her off a bridge. That doesn't get you suspended, Correct. but you have an opinion about politics, whatever, or whatever it may be. That's controversial. I mean, well, I didn't even realize you're educating me on yeah. the sensitivity um, yeah. of that. We have touched on politics. Mm -hmm. um, we take be careful. kind of a common sense approach. I suspect yeah. you guys well, kind of have the same yeah. view. I, I, I don't. But, I don't mean to interrupt you, but a perfect example: Kevin Nash is anti-Trump, which is fine. That's yeah. Kevin Nash is also. Is it fair to say anti-religion? Hmm. Is that he, fair? He, he is not religious, but okay. Kevin's a dichotomy. You know, Kevin, gotcha. we'll, we'll make fun of some of the Trump tards, but... Well, he also, then... he, he's also <laughs> taken the time to make fun of religion, <laughs> like Bill Maher has. But again, it's somebody... But he's like, also right. a gun owner. What's that? He's a gun owner. Yeah, go. He's sure. a gun owner. Yeah. But my, po my yeah. point is, as AR long as it fits the agenda of today, you can say whatever you want. So for me, who believes in Jesus Christ, as much as I like Kevin Nash and I respect him, I don't respect his ideology or his anti-religion thoughts or his amusement of it. I just don't find it funny, which is fine. But again, if you don't read the agenda, it's, it's, selective. it's, it's a problem. And I don't want it, to get too deep into this. That's yeah. the only point I'm trying to say. Yeah. If you were to go on and be pro-Trump, you would have a problem on your channel. Yeah, it, 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 it's 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 possible. I, yeah, I, we we haven't run into anything except the occasional demonetization, right. which we usually get reversed. Well, it's it's the um, reason I asked you, Sean, because basically we've gotten in trouble for our guests' opinions. We're getting right. suspended over and over again for our guests' opinions. That's not America. Mm. It shouldn't be. Well, when you appeal it, do you say that that this is a it's a form for expression? We're not it's, advocating. It's instantaneously, we're so we get demonetized on certain videos too, and then we appeal it, and then it usually gets accepted. Same type of deal, and then in some reasons, we have a cable show too 
the cable show has the exact same information mm-hmm. on it, but they right. won't accept that. Right. So there's a lot of BS going on. Again, I don't want to get mm-hmm. too deep into it, but you know, being the respect that we have for you as being this guy, we just thought it was important that we heard your opinion yeah, on this deal. Very much so. Well, what, what I think is happening, and I'm not in any way condoning it or saying that that there's justification for it, but political discourse, people disagreeing about politics, has been the cornerstone of programming for decades. Yep. From when they first started televising presidential debates in the 60s mm-hmm. up through uh, magazine news style programming in the 70s, like Radio, 60 Minutes and whatnot, Bob Grant and such, through the Radio. 80s, 90s, yep. you could have Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals um, debating, bringing up points. What has happened in the last six years mm-hmm. is there's become a a vile permission on the part of some extremists Mm -hmm. on both sides understood yep yep to personally attack right belittle Mm -hmm. cancel sure people that they don't agree with simply they've done no personal harm bingo they don't agree with my ideology. Right. So political discourse has now become personal conflict. Mm-hmm. And what does that bubble into? It bubbles into January 6th at the Capitol. It bubbles into things like this. So media sources are panicked. Right. Whereas at one time, you could have a kooky Missy Hyatt opinion. I don't know what she said on your show, but I know Missy, so I know it was kooky. Right. Um, You're on. You could air that. (laughs) Right. As a counterpoint and debate it with her. Nowadays, the media says, oh my God, people are going to take to the streets. It's really become the mentality. So I think that they are hypersensitive. I think the media is hypersensitive to that kind of political disagreement because in this day and age it has spawned so many uh, irresponsible people who don't understand, hey, Chip, people disagree with you and they have their reasons that they feel are as valid as yours. And it doesn't give you the right to go after them as a person. You can attack the position. You can cite your evidence to the contrary. But going after the person, beyond the message to the person, has become acceptable. Whether it's somebody trying to shit in Nancy Pelosi's desk because they don't like her policies or, you know, going after someone on the street, as, as, as we saw, like random violence. Um, so we're, we're in an insane time now we are. where it's like a third world nation. It's a classless thing. And I've said this on the air on our show, the left and right have bounced off each other so fervently they've gone around the world and they sit right next to each other they behave almost the same both sides want people canceled it's just different groups of people if you disagree or you do something that we deem as immoral we will cancel you or on the other side of things, we will go after you. So that that thought process, that demented thought process, lives in both extremes who have bounced off each other and now live right next to each other. We're not happy with something. We'll go burn things down. Maybe it's the Capitol because we don't like an election result. Maybe it's a city because we don't like what a jury just said. Right. So I'll burn down a city. Right. They're acting the same. They've become one dysfunctional party of extremists they just hate the opposite group well said uh not to uh switch gears but we might as well after that but thank you for that answer sean uh, and you thought this was going to be a fun jokey interview huh right where's the all the virgil's penis questions <laughs> Virgil's penis. <laughs> oh no the eric sim penis questions are coming the eric sims penis questions he has one 
There you go. Oh, Kuda, bam. Oh, oh, man. Hello. Holy matzo ball. Um, was, matzo there, ball. was there ever oh, any... Oh, matzo ball. I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Oi. Uh, was there any interview ever where... Okay, I, I know I'm asking you a rough question, but screw it. I only get to talk to you once, maybe twice, if you if you decide you like us. Uh, was there any interview where you just couldn't stand the wrestler as, as a person, and you were, like, gritting your teeth like, this guy's a douchebag? Did you ever have anybody <sighs> like that? No. Uh, well, look at you. <laughs> I'm. I, I, for me, I will shoulder the burden of a difficult talent, or a rude talent. Okay. If when they sit down, and the red light goes on, they give the product. Right. If they give the designated product, if it's a timeline. Were they, uh, did they have details about the events we brought up? Did they bring a dimension to the show? If it's you shoot, were they uncensored? Were they, did they roll with the jokes? Um, if it's a guest booker, did they uh, produce uh, some creative um, decisions or let us inside their booking mind in the process? Then that's the tacit agreement. Nowhere in my paperwork did I say you have to be nice to me. But I did say you got to deliver a show. And so if the show is there, uh, I was okay with dealing with difficult talent. Um, where the thing I didn't have patience for was if they sat on camera and took a shit as opposed to put on a show. Now, so that, that point, I would have a real problem with. At that and it didn't point, happen. Right, because obviously you're paying the talent. They, ju they do a giant shit. You're trying to make a DVD. Are you like, well, fuck you. I ain't paying you. Did you ever have that kind of confrontation? No. The only person I asked for money back was Jake Roberts. Uh, oh. He came to... We were going to do an episode of Breaking Kayfabe, which was a series that dealt with the outside the ring life mm -hmm. of the talent. Um, folks that had uh, interesting things to talk about in their personal lives. So we sat down with Jake, who I booked through DDP, and I told him we were going to talk about the, you know, his family history and, and everything on that show. So we sit down, he's paid, we're under the lights, the slate's in, we start the show, and after a couple of questions, he goes, I'm, I'm not talking about my family. I said, Jake, I have nothing on these cards about the DDT. I have to tell you this right now. That's what this show is. And he wouldn't do it. And he protested and we argued a while. I said, Jake, come outside, have a smoke. Let me talk to you about this. I wanted to engender that trust. We'd never worked together before. And I was always pretty quickly able to engender trust. If I have a superpower as an interviewer, it's that, I guess. Um, I don't think of questions that are necessarily innovative or different than anyone else does but in sitting with somebody for a few minutes i can i can put them at ease we'll, we'll and speak. it's not good good it's not a carny thing i i i think they sensed that i was truthfully there not to fuck them but rather to make them the most interesting interview they could be and to have the most inter interesting product for myself. There you go. So I said, Jake, spend some time with me. Come outside. Let me talk to you about this. No, 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 no. Can't do it. Can't do it. Now, in fairness to Jake, he had just started the program with DDP okay. and was clean. And I think from an emotional standpoint, he was not going to be able to talk about Grizzly Smith and a lot of what went on there. So at a certain point, I, he was refusing. I said, drop the money, and I'll have my guy take you home, take you to the hotel. And he did. Drop the money on the table, left, and I had him driven home. And uh, that was that. Um, uh, Buff Bagwell famously uh, was not able to perform the interview. I gave him a couple hundred bucks and said listen let's get another time don't worry about it i, I don't want to put you on camera like this mm. i think he was just very tired that tired night. well but listen buff's a personal friend he's a good guy yeah you know what everybody's got their demons i judge not but one thing too uh 
You were told. Well, let me about finish. The, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, I said, Marcus, and he got very upset that that I kept uh, that twice. I had to stop the interview and say, I can't do this with you. Mm. He wanted another chance. He said he'd kick out. I said, All right, kick out. Go ahead. We give him some time. Second time was was no better. And I said, Listen, I can't do this. I said, But Marcus, here's some money. Don't worry about it. We'll come. Cut you. Come back. We'll do it again. I have the script. You know, we'll shoot. You will shoot your timeline another time. So he, he was emotional, and he, you know, my guys helped him back out and back to his hotel. And um, he called me the next morning. He was like, "Hey, I'm sorry, brother. You know, uh, just a rough night last night, and uh, just just want you to please keep that promise to to bring me out and get the show." I said, man, that, that money I put in your hand, I consider a deposit. So, yeah, I'm going to bring you back. And about six months later, I saw he was coming back, and I called him. And I said, uh, you know, let's let's get that interview. And he said, well, sorry, brother. I said, uh, they're doing a documentary on me, so I don't do that shooting interview shit anymore for, uh, for no money. And I said, okay. I said, I, I want to remind you that I'm the guy that sat there while you drooled on my fucking camera for two hours and put some money in your hand and said, don't worry about it. I'll bring you back. To which he said that in return for that, he would punch my teeth down my throat when he saw me in New Jersey next. Very right. nice. I start Very my nice. uh, one of my books with this story. Wow. Uh, well, it's a favorite. I might have to retract that statement, sir. I do fuck? have to apologize. I would not think that he would have acted like that. It's fucked up. But let's go to something you talked about, people trusting you. One of your greatest interviews um, was the Roddy Piper, Pat Patterson revelation. How taken aback were you from that, or did you know this was coming? No, no idea. Uh, it didn't even make sense to me when, when he was telling. I couldn't, I couldn't get my mind around it because I'm like, where, where were they together? Was okay, California. He's telling me, and I even reached out afterwards uh, to Dave Meltzer. I wrote him. I said, I said, I, I got something on tape the other day. And I just, have you ever heard anything about this? And um, he hadn't. And he said the timeline was a little wonky. Um, Roddy mentions, you know, the Olympic Auditorium in L.A. Um, when he was 15 or 16. Um, listen, on the set, who, who, who might argue with him? I, I wasn't there for it. So um, I know Connecticut. Wasn't very happy with it. Mm. And at the time, they were promoting Legends House, where right. Roddy sure. and Pat were together. Right. And I know they reached out to Roddy and uh, said, you better go on some shows and talk about how you were wrong about this. Were or maybe they said, because I heard him go on and try to retract it on another show. Were you contacted by any seen this, by, uh, it's, ve WWE? it's very clear. What's that? Were you were you contacted by any chance by WWE? Like take no. that thing down? What were they gonna say to me? I sat <laughs> I there. And he, he was on an interview show. He right. told me his story, and that was it. Right. I right. didn't put him on in, in a lie detector. Yeah. My programming would have been terrible if I put wrestlers in lie detectors. Of course, of course. I'm just wondering if um, they had called you and given you some shit about it. Like take that down. No, no, never called me. Um, you ever speak to Vince McMahon? Though, <laughs> In person, what's that? Ever speak to Vince McMahon? Do you ever? No, I'm still waiting for the interview. I, he, I, I that he he'd get a great interview out of me. There you go. I wouldn't skewer him. I, I wouldn't even want to talk about the stuff that people are gonna. I don't really care whether Mel Phillips was licking anyone's toes in the '80s. <laughs> I would want to talk to him about <laughs> the, the rise in the in in '84. The rise of, the rise of Mel Phillips. The, well, no, no doubt there was a rise in Mel Phillips, <laughs> but I would want to talk about the rise of the company, yeah. and uh, and sure. just how that all came together. The, sure. the Cindy Lauper and and Hogan and the merchandising and buying out the cable comp uh, the the uh, the smaller stations and yeah. going national. I could spend five hours talking to him about 1983, four, and five in WWE. So Vince, when you call, that's what we're going to cover. There you go. Right, don't worry about it. I don't I'd care about it. twelve million dollar checks. Whatever's going on over there, I don't care. <laughs> Toe licking stuff like that. Yeah. 
So what do you think, big guy? Should we take a break, or do you want to keep going? Just keep going. Oh, we'll just, gonna, we'll just keep go going the then. Uh, I just want to ask you while I got you, our personal favorite interview, we got to interview Bob, ba uh, Bob Backlund. Do you have a favorite uh, interview? Is there anything that you know makes your uh, old warm and fuzzy in your tum-tum, as has been said? You know, my uh, the Roddy one that you mentioned, I have a soft spot for because I was such a Roddy Piper mark as a kid. I valued the workers that were captivating and charismatic on the microphone. I don't care that Roddy had a four move move set. That it wasn't important to me. And guess what? It wasn't important to all the arenas he was selling out and the pay per views, including the first WrestleMania, which mm -hmm. put uh, WWE on the map as far as the, that uh, format went. Uh, you know the uh, periodic uh, pay per view. So. The the Piper interview was special for me just because I was a fan and um, I could have conducted that entire thing without notes, just re remembering uh, the time that he had in WWE. So I thought that was a fabulous interview, not just because I'm such a mark for him, but because I thought it ended up being a great product too. A lot of the ones I like, guys, were not the best sellers. They weren't the ones that are all over YouTube now. Mm -hmm. The Tony Atlas you shoot, I found wildly entertaining. And not just because of the pronunci his pronunciation of many of the words. <laughs> I thought he, he was funny and, and charismatic and personal, and watching him react to some of these fan videos was classic. I, I so enjoyed that. The, Lanny Poffo's uh, you shoot and, and, uh, and Breaking Kayfabe, um god uh, you know as a as a fan i'm talking as a producer my favorite shows were the ones that made money sure period. makes sense period makes sense Cor Cornette, nash russo all the ones that you might suspect made what was tens your of biggest, thousands what was of dollars those seller? were my favorite what was your biggest seller oh god i i i'd have to be making a guess now because my eyes have been off the ledgers for a while okay. maybe Cornette's first guest booker um because that kind of uh, it was his first appearance with us he'd been on a couple of other shoot interviews before but in the guest booker format he shined and it was like it was like the 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 rebirth of jim Cornette. and then so we brought him back for uh, he did two you shoots he did uh, a breaking kayfabe he did there are a handful of talent that could have done all of our formatted shows um timeline you had to be working near the top of a card or in the office to be able to talk about an entire year in a company uh guest booker you had to be a booker for uh, a major territory um you shoot you've got to be a lightning rod entertaining be able to elicit a passionate fan response for all the questions um breaking kayfabe have an interesting off-screen life Cornette checked all those boxes so he was able to do all of our shows so i will i will attribute the uh the resurgence in his popularity to his work with kayfabe commentaries there you go sean being a fan first before you got into all of this being uh, you know a fan of pro wrestling how far into it were you before the fan itself? You know, now you're getting to meet, obviously, people you loved growing up or, you know, whatever the case may be. You look up to these guys, I would think, to a degree. We all do as fans. Uh, at, at any point, uh, how far into it after meeting some of these guys and seeing the reality of some of these guys instead of just the on-screen character, did that screw you up as a fan? Because I know it's messed with no, me a little bit. It, <laughs> little it was bit. right away that it, it, it became a business. Because there was too much at stake okay. to be starstruck. I was in the entertainment business for a long time right. before that. So right. I'd, I'd worked with famous people before. So it wasn't a starstruck thing. What it did do was when I sat down in the interview spot, if I was able to access the fan in me, if I knew the talent I was sitting with from my days watching them, it made for a better interview. So the interview was more entertaining. I was able to find follow-up questions and, and talk about things beyond the research uh, that we had on paper um, because I might have remembered this person from my, my sure. days as a sure. fan. Yeah. So I guess that dimension uh, was 
accentuated a bit, but there was no like, there was no coming down moment for me where I was disappointed to learn somebody smelled like ass or, <laughs> you know, that's not what uh, I meant. <laughs> Like this guy shattered. Like ass. When... I'm not rooting for him anymore. <laughs> not, not, not like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like you know, it's like God damn. I was a kid. I cheered for this guy, and he right. smells like a fucking yak's yeah. nuts. Yeah, that's a, that would be unfortunate. But, uh, Holy turnbuckle. Yeah, sure. Hey. So there are listen the the wrestling business and these guys navigating the world. There's a lot of comedy right. in watching these guys navigate the world. I just. Uh, I love one of my favorite things is when they use wrestler speak to describe real world non wrestling situations. It's one of the more amusing things. I just co authored Todd Gordon's autobiography, Todd is God, which yeah. will be out next how summer. That, how did that come to be? Because it's almost like you walked into the next question. How, how does that all come about with Todd? Um, well, I'll get to that in one second. Let me just grab the, sure. the story here. Uh, sure. Bill Alfonso, who's been a referee everywhere, and for he's got the business so ingrained in his soul. If if you cut him and he bled, it probably a red, white, and blue rope would fall out from under his skin. He's one of these guys that uses not carny, but wrestling terms for everything. One of my favorite stories in the book, they, they pull up to a, uh, a Waffle House or an IHOP, and if the lot was full, Alfonso's like, oh, they drew a good house tonight. <laughs> Fucking Waffle. I'm just so <laughs> imminently amused by stuff like that. But uh, Todd's <laughs> book, we had a false start uh, several years ago, like 2017, I think, when my when my first book came out, Kayfabe. Um I was going to write his book with him and uh, his sister had taken ill and he was taking care of her and he, and he just couldn't do it. He wasn't in the place, but I was all jazzed up and ready to write a book. So that was the first of six books that I wrote that year. And then last year, you know, we'd stayed in contact. And then last year he was like, I'm, I'm ready. I, I want to do this now. And I said, all right, done deal. Let's start writing. So last November, almost a year, uh, we started in earnest. I started recording our conversations and I got about 50 something hours of discussion over zoom. And, uh, we fashioned it into a book and it's, uh, the only authorized story of the beginning of ECW because he was there. Does, does Paul Heyman kind of absorb all Todd Gordon's glory in the eyes of the public? Because it almost seems like Todd Gordon's like mm. Abbott. And uh, Paul's clearly uh, Costello, and everybody knows Costello and laughs at Costello. But it seems like, what, the, what would ECW be without Todd Gordon? It, it, it wouldn't be, first Thank of all. Thank you. There you go. Uh, he started it in 1992. Uh, his booker, Eddie Gilbert, his first booker, um, brought his friend Paul down uh to uh the tv tapings in pennsylvania and uh good guy personal guy really smart Heyman. i mean my god mm -hmm. uh and uh todd put him on tv doing a manager thing and and paul from the beginning said don't don't pay me i'm i'm you know i'm, I'm coming down with eddie and uh you know i'll do some stuff for you here but don't don't worry about it you know don't pay me and they they'd formed a friendship and really that was the, the foundation of the todd and paul story was their friendship and uh just an amazing an amazing uh team for that product they were perfect for that ecw product Love their it. the stuff their minds came up with i mean you guys know Loved it. um but you, I am anxious for you to read the book uh, to see um, the trajectory of that relationship and uh, a lot of things that people have no idea about. Um, so it'll be interesting. I'll come back. I'll come back with Todd, and we'll talk about. It. Yeah, that. Nice. Yeah, we're very excited about that nice. book. We've been we've been waiting for it. So love that's going to be love it. So Sean, we're almost out of time. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, before we get to the Pharaoh's final question, I always want to know this. Tell me a little bit about your wife and your children. Um, my children, I don't think have ever seen a wrestling match in their life. Um, 
my wife may have. Well, I, I dragged her to a couple of events if there were people that I was going to see or meet. Um, but um, we are a very close family. We're uh, we're all in the arts. Um, my uh, oldest daughter is seventeen, and she's. We're in the process of visiting colleges, and I'm. Uh, auditing which nut I'm going to have to cut off and sell to pay for NYU or Pace or Fordham or anywhere that we've been. Uh, she's a musical theater singer. My wife is a musical theater teacher. Um, she owns her own uh, youth theater company outside of school. Um, and I have a 10 year old who just farts a lot. And, um, you know, she's fabulous. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're imminently normal. We just do really abnormal stuff for a living. Do you guys play pull my finger since she's got so much gas? Does she, you pull her finger. That's a little roller. You she's don't supposed have to pull, to pull your finger. Yeah. No, she's, she, learned at the, she learned at the foot of the master. Okay. Oh, let's let's, let's, let's not let this go off the rails. rails. I All right, here we go. I... The Pharaoh's final question, unscripted. Oh. He's just going to come out of his head. Oy. But real quick, Seven before inches. we get to the Pharaoh's final not, question, I do want to reach out to ESO creative Bruce. Bruce, thank Bruce. you so much for taking care of the show uh, while I've been gone. You did a fantastic job you're a great sponsor you're a great friend kudos to you bruce but on the other hand once you took over you got us fucking suspended so yeah, yeah bad luck i mean yeah what are we you always doing? say karma what? right not Cal karma no we don't say karma that jerk down south says karma gets All himself right. Power's final the question hey and he didn't want it to go off the rails you're dealing with me here there you go okay sean i know that you are a uh a novelist of horror, and you have three books out currently regarding thriller slash horrors. Uh, so you wanted something out of left field, and you didn't want something to go off the rails too late. Have you seen Halloween Ends? That's the I did. final question. It is, and he's got an answer. What a steaming pile of inept shit, right? I hope. Hold on, though. Uh-oh. He likes If you it. can divorce yourself. Oh, no. You're not going to do this, are you? As, as we've all had to do, if we're fans of classic horror, Halloween... Okay. Friday okay. the 13th. If you can divorce sure. yourself from any kind of linear connection to Halloween of 1978 yeah. and just take it for what it was, okay. it was an interesting commentary okay. and a little bit of metaphor in there uh, yeah. about the evil that lives in the hearts of people. Of you and me. Some yeah. burst into houses with knives, some right. burst into the Capitol. Right. And I got you. it's an examination of the evil around us. Okay. Okay, that's fair. I don't even so know what you two are talking about. Like I but you like this movie? Film? I don't even like... know what you two are talking about. It was 20 minutes of Michael Myers. Guy stupid. runs around with a mask and he kills people and he can't die. It's Leave dumb. Leave Michael alone. Anyway, he's got you a first. Uh, here's my here's my here's uh, my question. When is the biography on Eric Sims going to be written by that's you? That's your. And question. what can we be look forward to in that biography? And who do you think will write the introduction <laughs> to that biography? <laughs> now, I'd be happy. to... <laughs> I'd be happy to write the introduction of the seven-page pamphlet called The Eric Sims Story. Um, <laughs> chapter business. one, erectile yeah. dysfunction. Ooh. Chapter Ooh. two, how to fuck your talent out of a payday. Nice. Chapter three, how to... How to <laughs> I like Eric. I give him a lot of shit. Yeah. Eric right now, this is, is a must call, read. Keep going. Keep going. What's in chapter three? It, what I call a necessary evil in the business. You have to go through the agents sometimes. And for all the shit that I give Eric, every booking I had from him was on time, delivered properly, and in condition to work. And all of my business with Eric has been fine. He's a curious cat. He has done a lot of strange things. My favorite is when a talent would come in, have no idea what he was about to do. And Eric would tell me proudly, I tell my talent as little as possible about what they're going to be doing on their weekend with me. Thank you for that, Eric. I now have to tell them what a you shoot is as they're, I'm, they're sitting there. I'm ready to show them videos with questions about the size of their bushadil over here right. mm. and uh they have no idea what i'm about to do 
But uh, yes, the Eric Sims pamphlet. I'll work on that next after the release of the Todd Gordon book. Should be on a bestseller. A, on a serious note, Sean, thank you, sir. You you responded. We reached out to you with very short notice. It's an honor um, oh, yeah. to learn from you. It's an honor that you're part of the wrestling business. And I'm sure for the many fans out there, uh, you'll leave a legacy that will last a lifetime. And uh, we only wish you the best of luck in the future. Thank you. I, well, I want to tell you why I do your show and why I do a lot of shows um, because we're all in the same fraternity right there. I'm not in the fraternity with the guys in the ring. I'm in the fraternity with you guys who yeah. had to take a negative space in the world, nothing, and make something out of it. We didn't get in the ring ourselves. We never bladed. And we don't have stories about getting blown by rats at the Holiday Inn. Maybe you do. I don't know. But what we did was we took the sport and we have to create programming out of our passion. So I'm happy to sit and talk to you guys. I'm happy to sit and talk with most of the podcasts I do because we are all in the same group. Well said, sir. Have a wonderful weekend and we look forward to seeing you in the future. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. All right, Pharaoh, send us on our way. You've been watching Monty. And the Pharaoh. And until next week, folks, later. <laughs>